Here's a question for you. Just how far are the radical left and inside the Beltway bandits willing to go to stop him? They all know they hate him for winning the fight to protect life, for exposing their deep state, for draining their precious swamp. And they already know he'll crush Biden. So like a pack of rabid wolves, they attack. So let's impeach him. Let's get tainted radical left prosecutors to charge him. Let's conspire with Hillary and the FBI with fake stories about him. All to distract from Biden's incompetence, weakness, and money-grabbing corruption. But here's the thing, he'll never blink. That's called having the courage of your convictions. And it's why he's our president. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. Uh, the Trump side has been talking a lot about it. Let's bring in Trump's senior advisor and former public defender, Cash Patel. Cash, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning, y'all. Thank you. You know, as Peter just said, uh, you know, it, this case boils down to it's not, it's not about having the documents. It's about what happened after the National Archives asked for the documents back, and they didn't get all of them. And next thing you know, there's a search warrant executed. Next thing you know, there's a suggestion that things were moved, that there's uh, collusion, there's obstruction, there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah, to me, look, as a former federal public defender in Miami and a national security prosecutor, it's a little simpler than that. It's what charges have they levied based on what laws? They're opposing the Espionage Act versus the Presidential Records Act. The latter supersedes the former. So it doesn't matter where they were and who moved them and how if President Trump is the recipient of those as president of the United States when he left the White House. It's a pretty simple matter. What I'd like to talk about is some of the lawyers on Jack Smith's special counsel team. Remember, Jack Smith is the one who spearheaded the Bob McDonald case and got shellacked by the Supreme Court 9 to 0. Governor of Virginia. His deputy special counsel is Karen Gilbert, who is one of the most corrupt prosecutors to ever come out of the Southern District of Miami. Right. A couple of other things. Uh, Jack Smith, we heard all about his investigation. It was very public who he was bringing in. Now, why did he choose to go <laughs> so public with what he was doing? Why do we get all these leaks out of his camp? Well, it's the same playbook that the FBI and DOJ have run, whether it's Russiagate, impeachment one, impeachment two, Jan six, what have you. If it favors a story that helps push their narrative, they leak the information relentlessly, whether it's classified or not. And what they don't leak are their evidence of, are their actions of corruption by the prosecutors bringing this case. Right. And let me give you an example. The lead prosecutor, Karen Gilbert, who is likely to be the trial attorney in the Southern District of Florida in 2009, was so reprimanded in a narcotics trafficking case that she had to retire from her position. And years later, she was promoted upwards at the DOJ. And now you find, and don't believe me, go to the Ali Shagan case from 2009 and Judge Gold in the Federal District of the Southern District of Florida and look up Karen Gilbert. This is, she is uh, the Weissman to Jack Smith, and she has been pulling the reins on this investigation. And she was called one of the most corrupt people to guess what? She wiretapped the defense lawyer's investigative office to eavesdrop on the conversation between the defense attorney and the investigator. And before she got slapped by the courts, she resigned from her position. This person is leading this prosecution. Have you talked to President Trump? Have you asked him, was this worth it? I mean, why even take these documents? And when you are found to have them in your possession, just give them back. Because these are things like a letter from Obama, a birthday menu, which probably is not part of the classified part portion, a cocktail napkin, a letter from Kim Jong-un. You listed a few others earlier in the yeah. show. I mean, is it, is it worth it? I don't, I don't even know if America, I think Democrats and Republicans would agree that you shouldn't go to jail or be behind bars for more than 100 <clears throat> years because of this. If that were the case, I mean, Biden could, could go to jail, so could President Trump, depending on the different charges. But is it worth it? Why, why not just give this stuff back? To me, look, maybe I'm old school. The rule of law is worth it. 
And President Trump abided by the rule of law, whether he took a cocktail napkin or 4,000 boxes of documents. George Bush, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and President Trump should be treated no differently. The two-tier system of justice right. is on explosive display here. And it is, of course, worth it if, if and when I believe Donald Trump will be exonerated to show that right. he has been a political target rather than a legal target. So whether he took it or not is not the question to me. It's the why they are prosecuting him when they know they don't have a legal sure. justification to do so. But well, Cash, you know, Cash, let me ask you something about this, the, the jury makeup of Miami. You know Miami. Does he have a yeah. better shot at a fair trial there than he does in New York City and would have been Washington where he might be facing the January 6th charge? Well, sure, of course. I mean, Miami's a little better than um, Washington, D.C. and New York, but I think it's a pretextual forum shopping operation by these U.S. attorneys and the special counsel's office. To me, I think maybe this will backfire depending on the judge that this lands in, because I don't know that this case will ever get to a jury because of the legal questions at play vis-a-vis -vis the Presidential Records Act and Espionage Act. And oh, by the way, if you want to charge him with destruction of justice, he has to commit an actual illegality. So these are legal questions that may go to the judge yeah. and I think ultimately the appellate courts before it ever gets to a jury. And I think the DOJ may have uh, bought off more than it can chew by trying to quote unquote forum shop this case down to the Southern District of Miami where it's home court advantage for the deputy special counsel. Well, uh, Cash, we had Jim Trusty on a couple hours ago and he was talking about how much time, uh, you know, working on a case like this is. Now with the president, former president facing these mm -hmm. charges, which will be unsealed on Tuesday, potential case down in Georgia, potential case with Jack Smith and January 6th and all the other stuff. Does the president, former president, have time to run for president and defend himself at the same time? Because it sounds like a lot of this is going to be happening in the next year. I think so. And I'll just give you an example as a former chief of staff of DOD for him. I've seen this uh, individual as president operate hostage rescue operations, kill some of the world's biggest terrorists, secure the southern border, order us to deploy DOD assets to take on the narcotics industry, take out the CCP fentanyl flow, all in one fell swoop. That was one day for me in the White House. <laughs> so, yes, I think President Trump, of all people, can do both this campaign and effectively show the two-tier system of justice is targeting him and anyone who's supporting him next. I think he's the only one that they has the bandwidth multitask. to do so. All right. Cash, thank you very much for thank joining you. us today. Thanks, guys. Have a great morning. I'm Steve Ducey. I'm Brian Kilmeade. And I'm Ainsley Earhart. And click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. Joining me now, Jim Trusty, attorney for President Trump and former federal prosecutor Jim um, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, what can you tell us about the charges as you know them? Well, we don't have the actual indictment yet. I suppose they'll give that to us at some point between now and Tuesday afternoon. Maybe they're too embarrassed to give it to us early. I don't know. But uh, it's a combination of theoretical charges. Again, we just have a summary. We don't have the indictment in front of us. But it looks like uh, the Espionage Act, which is kind of laughable on its face, um, several types of obstruction and conspiracy and then false statements. So they're kind of throwing everything in the kitchen sink up on the wall in, a, in an investigation that even in just recent days, we have brought to light criminal obstruction behavior by the investigators. You know, it's, a, it's an amazing moment, Laura. I have not built a career attacking DOJ. I was a prosecutor for 27 years. I spent 17 years there, loved it. But this is outrageous that they actually have prosecutors who literally, among other things, and we've categorized a, a number of abuses, literally told an attorney that he probably won't get his judgeship if he doesn't flip his guy against the president. You know, you don't have to be a, a lawyer to recognize there's something really wrong with that. One of their main investigators, one of their main prosecutors, I should say, said that in front of five others who kind of looked down at their shoes and didn't say anything basically committing a federal crime at the Department of Justice to try to, to bring home cooperation from who they viewed as an important witness. It is astounding that that's not the real headline as opposed to this indictment. Well, NBC News um, a justice correspondent, Jim, says that Trump doesn't have a defense and that this legal strategy uh, that he has, I guess that you're leading, will just focus on discrediting the DOJ. Watch this.
Uh, Trump's lawyers are really not keen on arguing the facts here or the law and or arguing that their client is is not guilty of these potential charges, but they're more concerned with arguing about how the DOJ played hardball. And look, they did play hardball in this case. And we'll just have to see whether the Justice Department did anything wrong in the process of prosecuting this case. Jim, the argument that you won't actually argue the charges, you're just going to argue the reputation of yeah. the department itself. No, I mean, look, this was basically trying to appeal to somebody in that chain, that Praetorian guard for the Democratic Party, to have a conscience. You know, the attorney general is hiding behind the special counsel. He still controls special counsel, but he sat there and hid, didn't want to meet with us, didn't want to talk, didn't want to consider the ethical problems. We raised it quietly at first, loudly now, that their investigation is fatally flawed from outrageous misconduct, perhaps even criminal misconduct. But make no mistake, I mean, there are layers of defenses to these charges. And the most fundamental thing, just so your viewers get this, Laura, there's this thing called the Presidential Records Act. It is precisely dealing with presidents and former presidents and basically saying, and DOJ agreed with this years ago in a case involving Bill Clinton, that the former president gets to decide what he keeps. He should work really closely with archives. They can ask him nicely. If they get mad, they think he's holding on to too many things. They have a remedy called civil suits. There is no criminal penalty for violating the Presidential Records Act. It's a reflection of the fact that historically, before Nixon, they had completely unfettered rights to keep everything. Now we're saying at least please work with archives so we can see some of the stuff you created while you're in the White House. So well, one, that was the yeah. starting point. And by the way, Laura, one, one quick point on this. Sure. The referral from the National Archives to DOJ came from the White House, actually violating the Administrative Procedures Act, and they lied about this. They're the ones that started this thing the, the, poli the politicized bureaucrats at NARA, the archivists, were happy to push it forward and into this Praetorian Guard of DOJ who's hell-bent on well, prosecuting them no matter how many rules they break. One of the, one of the claims, I believe, one of the uh, counts will involve a, a potential obstruction of justice, which, as you know, in my old uh, career as a, as a white-collar criminal defense attorney, uh, Jim, was always considered very seriously, along with conspiracy uh, counts, which perhaps will be involved in this indictment as well, listed in the indictment. The, the, the concern that is raised that if, if the president was told not to move boxes and they have someone on video indeed moving boxes, even if there was nothing in the boxes, those particular boxes, boxes that that could be a problem. Or if tape recordings exist, that where someone tells someone, move that, that's where people get into trouble. How concerned about that are you tonight? Yeah, not, well, look, not, not as much as you might think, because if you really know the facts, and I can't play out all the facts on TV, but if you really know the facts, there's absolutely no intent there. There's nothing to make sense. In fact, you, you can't even obstruct a non-crime as a starting principle. So when you have the Presidential Record Act defense, when you have declassification as a defense, then there's really nothing. I mean, he could have had a party throwing stuff in a bonfire and it wouldn't be obstruction. But the reality is these guys have been desperately grasping for an obstruction theory for a political reason, which is they keep trying to set up this, oh, Joe Biden's wonderful holding on to stuff that he stole from a skiff in 1974, but Trump just didn't answer the bell. Well, the last thing the president said to DOJ, to that same guy who extorted a lawyer, was if you need anything, just ask. He told his lawyer at the time, show them where the stuff is kept in the storage room, and they did that. And so he says, just let us know. The next thing he gets is a letter that says, please put a lock on the door, which he does. And then DOJ goes black because that prosecutor was desperate to get a search warrant even before he had ever met the president. He had even, the Washington Post reports that that prosecutor, before they even did a subpoena, was saying, how do I get the nose under the tent at Mar-a-Lago, or words to that effect. So that's what happened. They dropped off a cliff because they didn't want to cooperate with President Trump's lawyer. The president was cooperative through and through. The lawyer would have been, but they went radio black until they show up in their khakis with their uh, laptops and their guns and their badges, and they do an unprecedented raid with really a general warrant that violates the Fourth Amendment, but we'll do a separate show on that some other time. Uh, Jim, do you think that if President Trump, this is a rhetorical question, had said last year or recently, you know, I'm, I'm actually not running for president. I'm not going to I'm not going to be involved in the 2024 campaign. I'm retiring from politics. How likely would it have been that they would have gone after him? Well, I, I think the fervor would have dropped 
0.5%. How about that? You know, really <laughs> yeah, hard to figure out. What does that say. mean? That's less than one, right? Yeah. Yeah, so a really small percentage. The only way, I mean, look, there, there is abject hatred for President Trump in some of the circles of DOJ and the FBI. So, uh, you know, he, he could have basically, like, saved an orphanage from a fire, and these guys would say he's lucky, and they'd still go after him. The other thing that kind of, that I think affects that whole equation is that Delaware, where apparently all investigations go to die, in Delaware, you've got horrific family-wide corruption, foreign corruption scandals involving the Biden family, as We're well as the that. laptop from hell, and they're, and they're mm -hmm. slow walking the heck out of that. So, you know, that's always cover for whatever soft deal they want to give Hunter to do something against President Trump. Say, look how balanced we are. We, we uh, softened a little misdemeanor tax plea for Hunter, and we also indicted a president for something no, that's well, not criminal. That's, that's uh, facially absurd. Now, uh, the New York Times just uh, reported tonight, Jim, that one of the charges is, in fact, a violation of the Espionage Act, now, your reaction to that, if that is indeed the case. Yeah, I mean, look, they're dusting off stuff that, uh, you know, across the board was apparently not in play when when Hillary, uh, you know, bleach bitted 30,000 emails that were under subpoena. But the Espionage Act includes a whole bunch of language that not just that the documents implicate national defense, uh, but that your intent Tent. is to violate the sovereignty of the United States, uh, to hurt the United States or to help a foreign power. That's absurd under any theory of this case. And they've got a whole bunch of rotating theories because they, they can't find the facts they want. But there's absolutely nothing remotely like that. You know, if he holds on to some documents or people pack documents and he has them in the storage room, uh, even if he talks about those documents or talks about the existence of them, that is light years away from the from the specific intent that they need for an espionage case. Jim, what's the president's mood tonight? I know he knew this was coming, uh, but give us a sense of what the man's feeling tonight. Um, you know, it, it's it's an interesting mix, Laura. You know, people think that uh, that you know when you're accused of something. It's pretty natural, at least from my client base, to really turn inward, right? You know, you're like, what the heck? How is this happening? It's a particularly hard moment when you're innocent, and he's actually innocent. You know, it's a little easier when you've done something wrong and you go, ah, crap, they finally caught up with me. That's not what we're talking about. So there is that kind of initial shock. I think he's got a lot of people around him expressing support. And that's a mixed bag. It kind of puts it in your head as, as a very depressing notion. But he also doesn't lose track of the absolute crossing of the Rubicon as a country, you know, the historic nature of a sitting president unleashing the hounds to go after a non-criminal event to, to basically incapacitate the opposition. It, it is an astounding third world moment. And again, that's not my shtick mm. as an attorney to go around saying that in cases, but that's where we are as a country. And, you know, the other people that are celebrating tonight better realize that they're letting something out of the genie bottle that's going to hurt this country for generations. Well, and the investigations can be turned on them and will be turned on them if this is allowed to stand. Jim, uh, we appreciate it. Obviously, we're cover covering every aspect of this. Thank you very much. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else. We check in now with the great one. I call him the great one. He's the host of Life, Liberty, Levin. Weeknights, uh, weekend Sunday at 9 p.m., top show on the network. The great one, Mark Levin. Mark, I'll just hand it to you. I know you got a lot to say. President Trump is 76 years old. If the Department of Justice gets his way, he will die in federal prison. Just by one of these counts, conspiracy to obstruct justice, which has a 20-year maximum sentence. This is a disgusting, disgusting uh, mark on American history for the future to come by these bandits in the White House, by the Democrat Party that don't play fair anymore. They don't want to just win elections. They want to take control of this country. They want one party rule. And they have used the Department of Justice and the FBI to get what they want. Merrick Garland is a mob lawyer. That's what he is. Jack Reed is a rogue Soviet-style prosecutor. The Presidential Records Act is not a criminal statute, and it was never intended to be. The Espionage Act of 1917 was passed under Woodrow Wilson, another corrupt president. Woodrow Wilson used it to go after his adversaries, and they imprisoned 2,000 people. So I suppose over there at the Department of Injustice, 
And this clown prosecutor spent a lot of time at The Hague. They probably figured these laws could be used to try and entrap Trump. All these obstruction issues that they claim, where the former attorney general, Bill Barr, comes up here and bloviates about it, and all the formers coming on talking about obstruction. They have them on obstruction. There'd be no obstruction issue of any kind, not even in anybody's imagination, had they not criminalized this case. This is a document case. A document case where a president of the United States or a former president faces 100 years in federal prison? Is this some kind of a sick joke on the American people? Joe Biden says he never told them what to do. Joe Biden had to sign off on that's becoming a National Archives case to have it go to the Department of Justice. Who does he think he's lying to? The American people? This is a guy that's got documents from the time he was in the U.S. Senate, for God's sakes, in his garage. I don't want to hear from the legal analysts the technicalities about false statements and obstruction. This should never have been a criminal case. Willful retention of documents. Well, what's the unwillful retention of documents mean? They're throwing all these process crimes and all these crimes that grow out of the criminal investigation against Trump. What did he do with the documents? Did he sell them to the enemy? No. That's why we have an Espionage Act, not to trick up a president. What did he do? Did he burn them all? No. The government has all the documents back. So there is no violation of the Presidential Records Act at this point. But they throw the book at him. They go after his attorneys. They make them testify. They're attorneys under the crime fraud exemption to attorney-client privilege. That means he didn't have due process. His own lawyers were being subjected to interrogations. And they had hundreds of in-person people testifying in front of grand juries. Thousands of collections of documents. For what? For what? And they indict him today? They indict him today in Miami? All of a sudden it's in Miami? All of a sudden we have a Florida grand jury? Because the moron in Washington figured out that there are venue issues that could lose him his case. This guy, this prosecutor, he lost eight to zero in the U.S. Supreme Court when they overturned the conviction of the former governor of Virginia because this jerk took a statute and expanded it. A jury in North Carolina wouldn't convict John Edwards because this jerk took a campaign statute and expanded it. And he's taken this case, and he's undermining the country, and he's interfering with a presidential election. And let me be clear, as Jarrett said, the Attorney General of the United States made this final decision. This is not the independent counsel statute. This is a special counsel appointed by the Attorney General under a Department of Justice regulation. This Attorney General, who pretends he's Helen Keller, he made the decision to indict the former president, and they made the decision to interfere in this election. You want to talk about an insurrection? This is an insurrection. And that's exactly what's going on here. Let me go on. Joe Biden is the crookedest crook that's ever been in the Oval Office. Everywhere we look, there's a predicate for a special counsel. They won't appoint a special counsel, even though it's compelled under the law in which they appointed this special counsel. And you're not supposed to appoint a special counsel against your political opponent. You're supposed to appoint one in the case of Biden. 20 shell corporations. $10 million coming from the communist Chinese military, spread out among the family. No businesses to support this. Endless meetings, endless meetings with, with Biden's, uh, with Hunter Biden's business partners. Bob Alinsky, who ties Joe Biden to the crimes. Mr. Big, Mr. 10%. And what does Biden say? Well, then where's the money? He's asking us, come and catch me if you can. The idea that this man is, isn't under a criminal investigation and that they criminalized a damn document case to go after Donald Trump is sickening. And I would say this to our fellow Americans. Don't be bamboozled by these cable channels and these fools who come on and tell you, well, he's not above the law. Are you kidding me? Democrat Attorney General in New York, 
Democrat prosecutor in Manhattan, Democrat prosecutor in Atlanta, Democrat Attorney General in Washington, D.C. What do you mean he's not above the law? There is no law. What's going on here is a disgusting disgrace. It is war on Trump, it is war on the Republican Party, and it is a war on the Republic. The radical left is doing what the radical left does while they cover up for Biden the way they covered up for Hillary. If Donald Trump is to be charged like this, Hillary Clinton should have been charged with 10,000 counts of obstruction because that's how many emails she destroyed and five counts of destroying cell phones because that's how many cell phones they destroyed. I'm done and I'm sick of it. What you said, you know, Mark, many years ago you said to me, and you said in one of your books, we're in a post-constitutional America. And what you're describing here, when you said they are the ones that are the, uh, that are abusing the power, that they've criminalized uh, political differences, that they weaponized the Justice Department, that's what you're saying. This, they, they love the term insurrection, and you're saying that's them. They're not abiding by the law. They're not abiding by the principle of equal justice or equal application of, of our laws. Am I hearing you right? You're hearing me right, and let me say this. Today, what is today's date? June 8th? June 8th is the day of insurrection, not January 6th. A weaponized U.S. attorney, a weaponized attorney general of the United States have unleashed the full force of the United States government against a former president, the leading Republican nominee to take on the existing president. We have never seen anything like this in the United States. We saw it under Stalin. We've seen it in other uh, autocracies, Marxist regimes, fascist regimes, the third world. But they have taken the United States of America and they have dragged us into a hellhole. This is embarrassing. It's humiliating. And I'm going to tell you something. There are tens of millions of us you have crossed the Rubicon twice, which has never been done. And we will never forgive you. Never, ever. And that's the bottom line. I'm done. Mark Levin, thank you.